That's right, my parents named me Merit. M-E-R-I-T. It literally means worthy of praise. How did they know? Growing up with the name Merit, that's a lot of pressure. Um, I once dated this guy whose last name was Worthy. Yeah, I was this close to spending the rest of my life being Merit Worthy. It's, it's a bit over, over the top, but you know, it's actually not a bad name for a motivational speaker, right? I mean, we know we can be a bit over the top sometimes. For example, when a speaker calls a meeting professional and we get your voicemail, it's pretty straightforward. Hi, this is Debbie, leave a message, I'll call you back. But when you call one of us, it's more like, Hi, this is Susie, CSP, CPAE, CMP, PhD, MD, ESP, MIC, KEY, MOUSE. I can't come to the phone right now. I'm either on a big stage giving a huge keynote for my full fee, or I'm on a luxury vacation with my toes in the sand and a drink in my hand. I've been upgraded to first class because I have billion mile status. So, why don't you leave a message at the sound of the tone, tell me everything that's wrong with your life, and I'll call you back with my thought leadership, so you can be your best self. (laughs) Am I right? I know, we know we're a bit much, it's all right. But hey, we have a big responsibility. You know, we have to make you look good at, at the event. We have to energize attendees with engaging programs. We have to educate them with relevant content, and we have to inspire them to see more for themselves. So I'm gonna make you a deal. How about, in our short time together, I give you a story, a couple key points, a little humor, some interaction, and a relevant takeaway for your business. And in exchange, all I ask is that when you book me, you give me more than 10 minutes for the keynote. Is that a deal? All right. So raise your hand if you know someone whose default answer is the word no. Raise your hand. Okay, you know, if you refuse to raise your hand, we're all looking at you go, there's one of those people. You know, we all know one of those people. We may work with those people. We may be in relationships with those people. Or in my case, happily divorced from one of those people. (laughs) You know, but there's a whole group of them, actually. You may know them. Collectively, they're called teenagers. Have you heard of these people? Yeah, my dad is in this group, not, not the teenager group. My dad is in the group whose default answer is no. But my dad's version of no is just a little bit different. You see, my dad, for the almost 40 years, has been, a, has been a, a, a volunteer with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. How many of you are familiar with Make-A-Wish? Yeah, they grant wishes to children with life-threatening illness. And my dad has been extensively trained as a wish granter. It's his job to sit down with a child and to find out their big wish. And no matter what their wish is, no matter what they say, my dad says the same thing. He says, no, not big enough. Are you open to more? I mean, it's the Make-A-Wish Foundation. It's not the Make-A-Realistic Request Foundation. So nine-year-old Ethan had a rare blood disease, and his big wish was to see his favorite basketball team play a game. And my dad said, no, not big enough. Are you open to more? So Ethan thought, all right, I want to see my favorite team, and I want to sit front row, center court. And my dad said, no, not big enough. Are you open to more? Well, Ethan couldn't think of anything better than that. But then his face lit up, and he goes, all right, I want to see my favorite team. I want to sit front row, center court, and I want to meet all the players. Now, I'm guessing you know what my dad said. I want you to say it with me and put a little attitude into it. No, not big enough. Are you open to more? 
All right, we'll work on that. <laughs> but yet, you know, Ethan was holding so much. He was dealing with a lot in his short period of time. But my dad was open to bigger experience for Ethan. He saw bigger possibilities. And that's kind of just what I grew up with. You know, I just, my dad was always challenging me to think bigger. And he t always taught me that in business, never take no for an answer, but take no as the starting point. And I think that's why I do what I do today, why people hire me as a mindset coach. Companies and organizations, they invite me in when their people are thinking small, when they're so frustrated and they're fed up, you know, because of competition, when they're overwhelmed with all the changes that are going on, when they're concerned about all the uncertainty in the marketplace. When you are fed up and concerned and overwhelmed and frustrated, it's really hard to see a big possibility. It's really hard to think big. And before you can be in action to solve a problem, you want to be in attitude to even identify that a, a solution is possible. So when you are at that intersection between action and attitude, that's when you are what I call open for business. Now, being open for business is so much more than the ability to transact business. It's the attitude to engage in business. And it's this mindset, it's a culture. When companies have a culture, have an open for business culture, that's when, that's what really attracts and retains top talent. That's when their sales teams are blowing the doors off their quotas. And, and it's when people who are following something, they want to find, follow a leader who's open for business. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, Merritt, this sounds great, open for business. How exactly? Am I supposed to have an open for business mindset? How do I create an open for business culture in my organization? And there are so many tips I could give you, so many strategies I could share. But if you're open to it, how about I give you just two that you could put into action right away? So the first idea, the first tip, if you want to really be open for business, is to listen for the absolutes. Now, listen for the absolutes means tune in to those generalizations. You know, when you hear people say, we've never done it that way. It can only be done that way. That is impossible. When you hear those absolutes, that's code. They're telling you, I have a limited ability to think about things in this topic. They're coming from what I call mini-mind. And nothing, no massive big ideas ever come from mini-mind. So the first tip is to listen for those absolutes. And the second part is how you respond to them. How you want to respond, the second tip is respond with open to's. Are you open to a discussion? Are you open to delaying that decision until we can gather more data? So let's just have a little bit of fun with this. On this side of the room, you're going to be what I call the absolutes. No matter what I say, you're going to respond, shout at the top of your lungs, absolutely not. You got it? All right. This side of the room, you're going to be what I call the open twos. No matter what I say, you're going to shout, are you open to another way? You got it? All right, let's try. We're going to serve only vegan meals at our conference. Absolutely not. Are you open to another way? All right, you've got one more chance. <laughs> okay, let's try another one. We think we're going to have to cancel our entire event. Absolutely not. Are you open to another way? Oh, very good. Did you hear the energy shift when you are absolute? There's no opening for possibility, there's no growth, there's no options, but when you're open to, when you respond with open to's, there's infinite possibilities, and you have the ability to grant your own wish. What's your wish? 
Would it pass my dad's test? Would he say to you, no, not big enough. Are you open to more? Ethan, Ethan got to go see his favorite basketball team play a game. He got to the arena in a stretch limo. He sat front row center court. He met all the players. Then he got an autographed jersey. He got to take home the game ball. And at halftime, Ethan went center court, got to shoot hoops, and he heard the roar of the entire arena. They went nuts when he made a basket. So I'm gonna challenge you to be your own wish granter. Be open for business in action and attitude. And the next time somebody comes to you with some small idea and they're thinking from mini mind, tell them, no, not big enough. Are you open to more? And when they absolute all over you, answer with, are you open to another way? Be open for business in action and attitude. And I'm gonna leave you with something that you can do as practice, you know, if you're open to it. What if you started your next event with a message that helps your attendees be open to all the amazing ideas and experiences they're about to have at your conference? That idea is merit worthy. A comedian, a certified speaking professional, and an expert in sales walk into a bar. Bartender says, hey, Merritt, what can I get for you? <laughs> All right. Well, that might not be the best example of my comedy skills, but as a professional humorist who's been presenting keynotes and training businesses for more than 20 years, there's a powerful connection between sales, leadership, and humor. And in this short video, I'll give you two simple examples. The first one I call stage style. So think about it, what do Chris Rock, Jim Gaffigan, and Margaret Cho all have in common? They're all excellent comedians at the top of their game. They're true to themselves and they lean into their own stage style. Imagine Margaret Cho doing Chris Rock's set or Jim Gaffigan telling Margaret's jokes. It really wouldn't connect. Leaders and sales professionals can study the most successful people in business, but until they know who they are and find their own voice, they won't stand out be memorable, or rise to the top. We value people who know their own value and communicate it clearly. The second lesson we can learn from comedy that is valuable for sales professionals and leaders, I call being liked at the mic. A comedian wants to be liked as soon as they grab that mic. They do that by being relatable as early as possible. Now, there'll always be a keynote spot for somebody with an incredible unique story that leaves the rest of us thinking, if they can do that, I can do this much less risky, pretty normal thing I'm facing. We might never be in their situation, but if the speaker's done a good job, people relate to their story. We love the comedians who poke fun at themselves, demonstrate vulnerability, and allow us to laugh at our own humanity. And those are the same qualities we appreciate in leaders. To be more influential with others, learn to laugh at yourself and find humor in spite of the challenges and change all around us. It calms people down so that they can focus on their goal. Whether I do a program specifically on the connection between sales, leadership, and comedy, or I just infuse the principles into another program, your audience experiences the benefits. People leave with lessons that they'll remember because of the laughter they enjoyed. I'm Merit Khan, reminding you that the first step to a closed sale is always an open mind.